Hi, everybody. My name is Curtis, and I'm here. Uh, this is LOAC TV. Welcome to LOAC TV, Library of American Comics Television. Uh, I stream weekly every Friday at 11 o'clock Pacific, 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern. And I'm glad that you were able to join us. I hope you've been checking out our past shows and, uh, and on our YouTube channel. And if you want, you can uh, subscribe to us. We're always welcoming subscribers. And then you'll get notified when we have some new live streams coming up. Also, follow us on Facebook and on Instagram and on Twitter. If you just look up LOA Comics on all of those social media platforms, you'll be able to find us. And uh, you can sign up for our newsletter if you go to libraryofamericancomics.com. Sign up for a newsletter, get notified about our uh, upcoming releases, which I know a lot of you are asking, what are your upcoming releases? We uh, we don't have a whole lot on, on the plate right now. We've got a bunch of... Um, I Irons in the fire, as it were. Uh, but we do have, for better or for worse, Volume 6 coming out in February. So you can keep an eye out for an official announcement coming uh, about that one. And uh, other than that, uh, we have a comment section on our... If you're watching on Facebook or if you're watching live on YouTube, you can leave us a comment and ask your questions as we're going through today. And, uh, and we'll be happy to talk to you. Uh, I want to introduce our guest our special guest, uh, I have Jeffrey Lindenblatt on the uh, uh, here on my screen beside me. Uh, Hi, Jeffrey. Hi, how are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for being on the show today. We're going to be talking me. a little bit about bringing up father. But before we get into that, um, I want to talk a little bit about your history with comics and, and comic strips in particular, because you have a long history uh, going back to, to the 90s. And... Um, Tell me a little bit about discovering comic strips for the first time for you. Well, I, I unfortunately, I'm, I'm good living in New York City, which had all the major papers that had the great comic strips. But unfortunately, in my childhood, my father brought home the New York Times. So there was no comics. I was deprived. I was a deprived <laughs> child. <laughs> I missed uh, all the great stuff on the 70s and 80s and the, in the you know, Daily News, The Post, uh, Newsday and all that kind of stuff. So I had no, I had no real experience with the comic strips until I started collecting comic books. And actually, the first full experience I had with comic books, comic strips. Actually, uh, I figured out it was like uh, you remember the magazine Amazing Heroes that Fantagraphics yeah. came out. It was the it was a it was a news magazine basically. Yep, totally. And they copied what comic reader used to do, where in their magazine they would reprint comic strips. And actually, the first comic strip I saw was the. Star Wars by uh, Williamson Goodwin. Oh yes, which I was a big Star Wars fan. I, anything, I mean, I had the I got the Empire Strikes Back book at the time and said Williamson, I'm I'm in, I'm in. <laughs> I and, just want to do a quick and, plug. You can find yeah. those strips in right, our you can library find those strips of American there, yeah. comics, Star Wars books. <laughs> they got another book because the back of the, the back of the magazine had Star Hawks by uh, Gil Kane at the, the back of the book. Oh, nice. Okay. Also published by the Library of American Comics. <laughs> yeah. I can't reach, that one's up there too. I can't reach it quite. Right, much. right. Really so well. also, I got also some of the comic readers, which at the end of its run only ran the Superman comic strip in the 40s, because yeah. that came from the Mummy Falls Gazette. So that was my first foray into comic strips. Later on, I got to read uh, when uh, Kitchen Sink came out with their Spirit Kyle book and yeah. their Steve Canyon magazine. And then I got into Comics Re Review, which was the magazine that had all the, the current comic strips, popular comic strips at the time that you know I would like to read, like you know, that Steve Canyon, Secret Agent, and Corrigan, right. uh, Hag of the Horrible, and a bunch of other things. So I really got into that. But then the thing I got into was I wanted to read older stuff, mm -hmm. and the, the ability to get the older stuff was only like when you go to libraries in New York, in New York City. I was in, I lived I lived in Queens, so you go to the library, but they only would have. The New York Times, you wouldn't get the comics things. <laughs> I mean, every sub sub main library would have just the New York Times, but you don't have any comic strips. So I had the one day I went to the city, and there's the, the famous library in New York City with the, the lions and everything had runs and runs of papers. Now, the <laughs> here came the problem when you get to this is okay, I like to read this particular comic strip for this paper. And every and you go to the book side that has an index of all the articles, every bit there. But they don't tell you what comics or anything. Since <laughs> comics is considered low brow yep, toward no the high echelons of newspaper people, even though mm. comics basically sold comic uh, newspapers for many, many years. Yeah. So you just had to uh, go in and you had to go for Mike and Film. Luckily, I, I was going through actually the New York Post, which I got to read the Superman comic strip, which because I'm, you know, as a comic book fan, I want to read Superman. 
So I got to read like 1941, 42, all, all the way up to 1956 before the paper dropped it. it you know, right. although you guys don't have the 50s yet either. So I love to see that. <laughs> <laughs> but no, then then I got into, got into that's how the first, first spill experience of getting to comic strips. And then later on, I, I uh, before I got involved in the industry, helping out certain things, I actually did the old-fashioned way. I got I got, got daily news at home, and I started clipping out newspaper strips and put them in photo albums and stuff like that. And I did uh, Dick Tracy at the time by Max Collins and, and Spider-Man were the two big ones I started collecting, actually, strip-wise. Yeah. And then I found out in the back of the buyer's guide, I found you can get the old strips and from only small, few collectors. They were selling at the time. So I used to get a bunch of bunch of Prince Valiants and different things over time. Nice. So that was my first hooray into as a fan, yeah. as they say. Uh, but years later, I got if you want, uh, years later I got involved in the behind the scenes stuff, helping out different publications, over right? Time, researching and getting copies and stuff like that for the, for them. Yeah, you actually sent me yesterday. Um, let me see if I can find it here. You sent me this article that you wrote. Uh, you did a poll. Yeah, and for better or for worse. Came up as uh, the top, the top spot, right. the number one spot. This was in yeah. 1987, right? The, the, yeah, that was 1995, actually. Or 1985. Yeah, that was a. I I got to meet the people, a person named David Astor, who was the syndicate news service editor, and we, I talked to them and said, let's let's do a. Uh, I talked to Vince about let's do a survey, take the top 100 circulating papers, and find out what comics. Because the, that information, you know, syndicates are not really want to give that information out where they, you know, how many papers there is. Because you can, at, you can actually go to them and ask them, I want to collect this strip. Where can, is the closest paper I can buy it? They'll yeah. give that information. But they won't tell you, oh, well, you have, you know, exactly how many papers. It's like a war of secret information. So this was an idea. We, the, the editors published, always published a top 100 list of the most circulated papers. And we got, we got, we called the editors up. They send the papers, and then we cut, uh, we c compile the list. And that particular list, eighty-seven of the papers had for better or for worse at the time. Now wow. that does not go into factor that some of those papers, there's no way they could get a hundred, hundred for a hundred because if, like for example, New York, you have the New York Daily News, the New York Post could not run that particular strip, so it right. would still be in circulate. So it would basically. Uh, for the worst, basically at that time would be a hundred percent in the sense of markets and stuff like that. At the oh, okay. Time. Wow. But um, but then before that, I was involved in in uh, be able to do research for people because I was luckily in New York and I had access to a lot of newspapers on microphone, which was the only time at that time really to find old stuff unless you have a, a collector that's willing to borrow that stuff. Right. And um, the the problem comes in is now now today you're lucky you can go online and you go to newspapers or dot com or newspaper archives or then you have like over 300 400 papers to go through and you can actually uh, do research on the particular strip. But back then you just had the micro microfilm and luckily you mostly have your local papers. But then luckily the New York Library has some a lot of out of town newspapers that you can actually research and stuff right. like that. But I don't know. Uh, I don't know what you have in Vancouver, but in your library is there. Our libraries have a microfilm library as well. The paper selection is limited to mostly local stuff. We have a. I, I'm here in Vancouver, and so yeah. we have the Vancouver papers, of course. We have the Seattle paper. I think is archived there as well, but mm -hmm. um, that's about it for us. It's hard to do research. So when I was doing the research for my Chuck Jones book, mm -hmm. uh, the Dream That Never Was, I was trying to find newspapers that carried the the Crawford comic strip, and mm -hmm. that was, it was only like that's a rare I, one. That's hard. Yeah. So rare. I think I only found about four or five papers that actually carried the strip, and none of them carried it through its entirety. And and um, it was just impossible. That was before newspapers.com was really I, – I think mm -hmm. I could look in, in there, but it was not – they didn't have it as big of an archive as they do now 10 years later. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I I, I think one of the books that I, that I got involved indirectly with, with – it was the Wonder Woman book. Indirectly, what yep. happened was I, you know, as a collector, and one I think it was uh, at the time I bought a, uh, I think Gordon Campbell was he had a catalog at the time. He was one of the big strip strip people, and he had about almost a complete run of the Wonder Woman comic strip. So nice. I bought that from him. Wow! And it was missing the first six weeks. Now what happened was uh, the strip began on May eighth, nineteen forty four. I've not found one paper in the in all my research that ran on May eighth, nineteen forty four. Okay, the first paper, the earliest paper I found was on June fifth, 
Now, what's interesting about the June 5th was, is that the two papers I found it in was the, the strips that he had were from the Chicago Hearst paper. And I lately found it in the New York, New York Journal American, which was the Hearst American paper, uh, New York, Hearst New York paper. Right. They replaced the strip because of the death of George Herman. And okay. his last date was June 3rd. And they replaced it to fill up a spot because most of the strips, when they end, the syndicate already has already set up already for a replacement. Right. So May 8th, they didn't have it for the first day. So, but the good thing was that the first six weeks, see, the, the, the Chicago paper started on the June 5th date. The New York paper started on the May 8th date. So I got to able to copy the first six weeks. And they would, and, they, and for the rest of the run of the strip, uh, they were like three weeks behind, but also good. Also, the scenario is good for me because a lot of the strips that I was missing were all the holiday strips. Oh, okay. And the holiday strips, you know, they, they either your very the Hearst papers did not reprint. Like sometimes when January 1st comes out, you would find it on the December 31st, you would have the January 1st strip with the December 31st or the day after. But yeah. Hearst papers hardly did that. So it was missing. So I got to collect that. So all in all, by the end, I had every strip except for one. Okay. So then I had some hard times. I met I met Paul Levitz at a convention, who was at the time the publisher of DC Comics. Mm -hmm. Said, "Would you guys want this set of Wonder Woman strips?" I said, "Sure." I, mean, I sold it to them, and and I got things. Then then years later, uh, Dean calls me and said, and they said we have a problem with the one. But I said you're missing one strip, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. Says, "How do you know? That was my collection I gave to them years ago." <laughs> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so, but then years later, I found that strip on, and it's, but it was on the website. You guys got the miss. I found that missing strip twenty years later. Found the That's right. <laughs> yeah, it was too late to include in the book, yeah. unfortunately. So that our, our book, our Wonder Woman book, does not have that missing strip. But um, mm -hmm. should it ever be reprinted, Dean will include it. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, you can find a high res version of it on our website. We put it in our blog. So if you go to the blog and search for the Wonder Woman tags, you'll be able to find that single strip that didn't make it into the Wonder Woman book. But yeah, very cool. I appreciate your efforts on that. That's very, that's, that's great. <laughs> a hard strip to find is one of the hard strips. <laughs> yeah, but I've been, well, I've been involved with that kind of thing for years, doing finding things and stuff like that. I mean, over, over time. Yeah. And that's, um, that's something that you, let's talk about your magazine called oh. the, the missing years. Cause you, you uh, graciously sent me a big box of these, these comics, <laughs> the missing years. This is your magazine that you did mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. quite a number of years. Yeah. Um, and the purpose of it was to find those strips that fell through the cracks from other publishers. Um, right. Right. Never. There are, there are examples of here, like um, you, you include in one of these issues, just, four Sherlock Holmes strips that didn't make it into a, a previous reprint effort. You right. just stuck them in there because no one else has reprinted them. So well that that was the second thing. Originally originally the magazine I was at the time already printing a magazine called Strip Adventure, which was reprinting adventure strips that were not printed like in comic review at the time. And then at the same time all these publishers, there was like Blackthorn, Dragon Lady Press, um, uh, Kitchen Sink they all were the big in the eighties. They were the big companies. They were reprinting comic strips. They either went out of business or stopped publishing comic strips. So the idea was to fill up the gaps for collectors. Yeah. And the original lineup originally was we took, picked up Dick Tracy from the Space Age stuff. That was like Dick, it was, Blackthorn had a Dick Tracy month weekly magazine, the comic book that ended in issue ninety nine and they nineteen sixty four. So we picked up from that point. Mm -hmm. We also did uh, Terry the Pirates with George Wonder because everyone's been asking for that, I believe yep. it at the time. And the only and this is what I unfortunately all the critics over the years hated Wonder, so Wonder had a bad reputation. But then I met people who really liked him, and then I have conversations with people about Terry and the Pirates. They said, oh, "I used to read it, but there's certain times." Says, "What year did you read it in?" "Oh, I read it during the Korean War." I said, "No, that was that was Wonder, not the Kniff." But that's right. A, a little 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 tidbit because Kniff got Kniff is Kniff is a one of the gods of the comic strip business, but he unfortunately overshadows what happened afterwards. So, yep. so the people were happy to see that, uh, and we got the actual strips. We had a guy, guy left by fixing them up. So we ended up reprinting about the first ten years of it over the sixty issues that we did. Yeah, we also did Captain Easy and Wash Tubs. Originally, we started with nineteen seventy, which was was the Jim Lawrence period. But because at the time, wasn't sure if NBM was going to do the Leslie Turner stuff. They did the whole Roar Crane stuff. Wasn't sure at the time, but later on we got to do uh, like a bunch of oh, 
Les, Les Turner is one of the best uh, followers ever in the comic strip history. Yeah, uh, following as the sec as, as the second artist on the strip. And then we ran a strip called Jim Hardy by Dick Moore, which was had a book, but it was one book that came out. Uh, then they did one time. We ran that in the magazine. So it was, and then we over time. We added uh, Secret Agent X-9 uh, with uh, Charles Flanders, and then later on, Nicholas Ofonsky, then Austin Briggs. And then we added Dewey, uh, well, I did, we actually did Rip Kirby, the, the Alex Raymond stuff that was not reprinted at the time, although now you guys have, have everything in one, one series. Basically. Yep, that's right. So we, did, we got to do that before you actually started, which was at least, at least <laughs> good. <laughs> and then we did, we did Johnny Hazard. Uh, and we actually did some jungle gyms that were not reprinted by Pioneer, and then we also did Mandrake the Magician, where Pioneer went out, stopped them. They went out of business, so we picked up where they left off on that. Right. And then we talk about the little things that we found, the little strips that were missing, like we did the Sherlock Holmes. We reprinted some Mandrake dailies that were missing from some of the books, like we we see here and there. We actually did the last nine tales of the Green Berets, the, the Joe Kubert stuff that was not reprinted in any of the publications. Oh, they, all, wow. they all stopped stuff. So we, we kind of filled up that kind of thing, and it was a fun run. Unfortunately, we, we would love, I would love to continue it, but the, the publisher unfortunately passed away, and we just ended it after that. So yeah, but it was a good run. <laughs> I was happy with it. Yeah. It's very cool. I love the, uh, the effort, and um, it's nowadays i think you could probably do something very similar doing just like the print on demand with amazon you wouldn't even have to uh mm -hmm. to worry about printing off the whole copies and shipping them around and stuff yeah things have changed over the years but then of course you have to figure out first you got to find the material again yep, which, is a, right. which, is a, which is the number one issue and then you gotta get it fixed and you have to fix them up find someone willing to sit down and do all the work yeah it still is a lot of work it's not just simply throwing and, it and out then there. of course the rights <laughs> issue the, how, the rights issue is a big issue you yeah. know that's that's the three big things we're always determining, and the question is, people will people be interested? You know, that's yeah. always the thing. It's, it's very true, and there are. Uh, so I'm hoping that um, there will be another group of people like yourself that will come and um, Sorry take about up that. The, the light. The light goes off every few minutes. You know, <laughs> that's okay. move. It's one of those things. <laughs> um, so yeah, so these these are great, and I. I think that that's that's really cool. But this also led you to um, to working with some other people. You've done. Uh, let's segue to oh. um, uh, Gasoline Alley. I want to hear mm -hmm. your Gasoline Alley story. Oh, okay. All right. So uh, I, I don't know if you know, um, Gasoline Alley has been in the New York Daily News since day one of its existence as a daily, and it's still there. So it's in a, in comic book history. It's it's the only. It's like should be over a hundred years. The New York Dailies was the only paper that ran all 100 years of the dailies. Yeah. Talking, Sundays, it may drop it a little bit, but I'm not daily wise. And when it had, came up with the 80th anniversary of the Daily News, I I knew Jim Scancarelli, who was the uh, current cartoonist. I talked to him about, you know, you should you do, you do, we should do a story about, you know, the characters in New York because, you know, this is like the 80th anniversary. It's the only paper that's been running it. I mean, Chicago Tribune dropped it by this time, so yeah. you know, it, it, and stuff like that. So he said to me, "Okay, do me a favor. Go around town and take some photographs of. Uh, go to the, the Daily News building. Take the photograph of the globe that was. You know, it, you, you, if you've ever seen the Superman, the original most picture, the first movie. Yeah, they walk into the Daily Planet. That's the Daily News building, the big globe and everything like that. Nice. In different locations. Yeah. So I took some photos for him and said, "Take a picture of yourself." I said, "Okay, fine. I'll take a picture of myself. I don't know what he wants to do for." So he, he ran the story in the, in the 80th anniversary. At the end of the story, you have an adventure. The two of the characters have an adventure. Yeah. And uh, they even have like the Daily News, uh, old Daily News new, uh, bo uh, truck delivering the papers in one scene. And then one day, I find one of the days says, oh, I, uh, I put you in the strips. In the strip? What are you talking about? <laughs> so so he, get, he end up, so he end up, I got it here. This, he put me in, this is the actual original art. And he actually put me as a Russian spy. Which is fully correct now. That's and that's awesome. me in the in the storyline. This is 1997. I've and, got some de detail that uh, I can show you here. Yeah, yeah, that, and that's me. I'm the real agent. So the real there, agent. Then, uh -huh. So this is uh, the the dates are December 15 and 16, 1997. There's a close up mm -hmm. of you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> in comic book form, how awesome is that? That you've well, been <laughs> my, 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 my fable said I should be in the comics. I'm in it. <laughs> That's, That's so cool. Very, yeah. very awesome. I love yeah. it. What a, what an honor that is. Right. Uh, but, then I, have, but, 
<laughs> Sorry, go keep going. Go ahead. No, no. As I said, I, I I had met a lot of cartoonists over the years in the process, and and I actually got to do met them and actually cover some me for the magazine. That was one of the great things stuff. And I have one here that that's really rare. It turned out I ha originally this was intended for the Strip Adventure magazine, which have all the characters in the mega. It was like a kind of a comics view with like eight different characters. Yep. But when we did, the magazine didn't last long, so we canceled it. And when we did the missing years, and we answered Mandrake into the magazine, I said I had this cover that Paul, that Paul Norris did of all, and most of these characters he actually drew because remember he was the guy who um, did a lot of the King featured comic books. Mm, so right. he did Flash Gordon, and he did all these. Uh, he was famous for Brick Bradford, which was he he put in the middle there for himself. All these characters were in the in the uh, in the magazine at the time. You can see that's. Uh, uh, Tim Tyler, Rip Kirby, Phantom, Secret Asian, Alley Oop, Mandrake, yeah. Secret Asian X9, Tarzan, Prince Valiant, and and I, was not, I think Steve Roper was. I think I, I'm not sure what that one was. And Very he put cool. they put put your put your character you know Spanish story. Put Brick Bradford in, and so that was used as the 42nd cover for the 42nd issue of the magazine. But Very it was cool. done like way after he passed away, so it was like a you know, yeah. That that's very very cool though. Like all of a sudden, there's brand new art that no one has ever seen from this guy that uh, is mm -hmm. is a legend. Yeah. <laughs> and passed away. Yeah, very we cool. ha we had covers done, but we had Gray Moore do the cover for us. We were we reprinted the his Flash Gordon run that right. he did in '91. We had a Flash Gordon. We had uh, we also had uh, Jim Skanker do the co cover for us. We had Fred Fredericks do the cover for us. We had uh, Jim Keith. The Flash Gordon artist turned Sally yeah. Four Thirds, and we had Andrew Peepoy. And I had found one. Of this is for the uh, issue that for us all pasted up already. This was the tenth anniversary issue, issue thirty-seven, and he lo he loved Captain Easy and Watch Tubs. That was his yeah. one of his favorite strips. Of course, he, he actually drew Annie, and he actually did, did he actually drew two weeks of Dick Tracy recently, uh, with yeah, filling into right. Joe, Joe Stanton recently. So it was it's uh, it was nice stuff to do that cover for us at the time. Awesome, but. Mm -hmm. Um, I've got a little show and tell as well Ooh. that I wanted to show you. Um, this will segue into our next topic about yeah. bringing up father. Um, I was sent um, by a friend uh, a couple of puzzles <laughs> that I want to show you uh, of bringing up father. Here, I'll actually I'll turn on the other camera so you can see. But these are um, something that he said his father had tucked away for a long time, uh -huh. and um, and just a ah, he stuck he stuck out now. <laughs> yeah, he's with his boys in the club. Yeah. And it's missing a couple of pieces. Uh -huh. um, but the copyright date at the bottom says uh, 1933. Mm -hmm. So very cool. Uh, there's mm -hmm. this puzzle. It's wrapped in plastic. And this one I had to unwrap because I couldn't get all the pieces. It had come apart. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, missing some pieces. But at least yeah. Jigs is there. <laughs> Incomplete. He, yeah. The rest of it, yeah, missing all these ones. And I, right. I have this puzzle piece that I don't even think goes mm -hmm. with with it at all because it's kind of a, drawn in a different style but uh yeah very cool You'll find that puzzle and be a mystery for us that's take right you 20, <laughs> take you 20 years to find that one the puzzle now oh boy but that's very very cool i love old yeah. artifacts like this mm -hmm. um, that come from the era and like in, in the 30s this yeah. strip was huge popular yeah, so i mean yeah. But yeah that was the, the last peak of the uh, strip it was like the, the 40s the top but that's but that's when it was still uh the big the big strip still popular yeah, well, let's talk about this book for a little bit. Where did I put it? Uh -huh. um, Library of American Comics put out two giant books of Bringing Up Father. They, mm -hmm. This is the second one that they put out, but it's mm -hmm. actually chronologically the comes before. The first volume uh, was called From Sea to Shining Sea, and Dean picked that you one. Did, you did the Ian Jones thing, huh? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Which is the um, anniversary day. Going, yeah. <laughs> uh, he he picked that that volume because of the famous story, uh, the World Tour story that that mm -hmm. there. And but then that's the sales of that one warranted to doing another mm -hmm. volume. So he picked this one, which is a couple years, the two years mm -hmm. immediately preceding it. So this is actually, if you're looking to buy um, the the books and you want to read them in order, this one technically comes first. So we're going to talk about this book today. Um, bringing up, or is it, sorry, it's called "Of Cabbages and Kings." Now, Jeffrey, you have been involved in um, a different "Bringing Up Father" reprint series. Do you want to tell me a little bit about that one? Yes. Uh, do, after any, actually, because of the success, I would I will tell you the, the success of the Peanuts books that re re revived a lot of the reprinting books. Yep. NBM, who was doing, did the uh, Terry and the Pirates, did Tarzan, and did Captain Easy. Decided to go back into reprinting comic strips. 
Yeah. And I was talking to them and they hired me. We were, the idea would do is a series called Forever Nuts, which was basically early comic strips, sitcom type, humor type strips. The first book we did was Early Years of Mutt and Jeff. So it was a randomly different strips of, the, of Bud Fisher's early run on Matt, Mutt, Mutt and Jeff. Yeah. That did pretty well. The second one we did, which was a, a book on Happy Hooligan, which was hardly ever reprinted by yep. Opera. And what we had a problem with that one was, was the Opera, every strip would be either a full page, half a page. It was like, basically, he was most like the filler in the, in the, full, in the, in the four page section. So we had to decide, we, we decided to run only this particular size of six, seven panel strips. And that would became that one. Unfortunately, that didn't sell that well, personally. Yeah. It's up. So we wanted to get a third one that was actually going to sign that. But I was complaining. This was like all the books we've done beforehand were all um, best ofs. You know, p- jumping on. I, I'm, I'm a completist. I like to read sequentially yeah. stuff. Totally. So I said, let's do. Let's do bring my father. It's a long. It, we have a lot of. We have like if we, if it comes successful, we have a lot of years to do with it, and it could be you know, and also a lot of. Unfortunately, at the time. A lot of that strip is 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 production cost is is down because of the rights issues because it was it was PD all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So we decided to the 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 first the, the early years of bringing up father. We got the material, everything ready to go, and then we saw I saw an article on the train when I was going back home that you that the IDW announced the 9, 1939 bringing up father book. <laughs> Yes, that's so right. Said, and there's an uncardinal, there's an unofficial cardinal rule in the reprint business is not to reprint the same things. If you if you yeah. guys were doing tearing the pirates, we don't do tearing the pirates. We don't do you know stuff like that. Yeah. So I, I called up. Now I was friends with with uh, Greg uh, Greg, who was the uh, one of the guys there. The idea called them up and said, "Listen, guys, I'm doing this book. Said, you're you're the one doing that book." And, and, and next thing I know, <laughs> and, and then it, it was worked out. Happened was that. People, people at Merrick McGregor were talking to one person in the company, and we were talking to another person in the company. Two different people doing the same type of jobs, getting yeah. rights to reprint stuff. So behind the scenes, it worked out. We decided that since we are reprinting stuff from the very beginning, and technically, we couldn't be stopped technically because of, the, of those ish, of those 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 strips yeah. in a sense. It was made. An agreement was made that this would be done, and and, and that would be. I'll do the first one. Unfortunately, because of the sales of the second one, there was less of print run of the third one. But then it uh, sold so well, uh, and it just and then and then. But then we, you know, as you know, going back to print on something is not easy no, when you really sold most of the stuff. So that and then because of other reasons, that was the last volume of the series, and we got at least we got at least that book out the first complete two years of the of bringing up father. And there never most of that for them to reprint reprint before, except they, there was a volume of Hyperion Press back in the seventies. They reprinted the early uh, some of that stuff. Yep. This was a complete two years, and I was happy. I got I got I R. C. Harvey did the introduction for that. I got Bill Blackbeard to do one of his his la, actually his last introduction before he passed oh, away. Oh wow! That was that was and I, and I and I I miss him. I, I he was he was a very I, he was I used to call him at least once a month for many years. And it was, Great to have conversations with him about all the comic strip and stuff like that, yeah. and 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 having some adventures with him, getting material from this, from, from the libraries. And stuff. Right. But uh, it was it was a fun book to do. Wow! And so yeah. that and that book came out at the same time as Dean's book, and uh, <laughs> but what so, you know, bringing up father fans were probably it, overjoyed to have two books coming out at yeah. the same time. Like that's just right. fantastic. Yeah, yeah. So it was nice. It was nice to see both. I mean, I can understand. I can understand that why, in a sense, you pick the best period to do that. I mean, I'm a historic, I like, I'm a, I like a, a completist, so I, I was happy to see that one. And you picked the, you picked the best period to do. Yeah. The famous storyline that was that like like almost in the sense of your of your the books that had the one the small the essentials. Same in perspective, that was an essential bringing a father period of the show. Yeah. Yeah. And I know Dean has talked to me about his philosophy about that. It's like, if there's, there's no way that he's going to be able to reprint all of bringing up father, there just isn't the fan base to sell, you know, $50 books for that, that long. So if he's only going to be able to do one book, got to pick the best era. So that's why he picked that one. And then he was able to and pick. It's pick also it. interesting that when I, we were talking about this, it came to my mind is that, when you take characters 
that into a new like a trip yeah or something like a trip you give them such extra life to them i mean i mean look at it, certain sitcoms i love lucy did that for a whole year they're traveling through europe with some right. famous episodes the honeymooners did it jack yeah. Benny did it. all the famous people do that in their uh, in their in the sitcoms to bring them to a different location to give some new extra oomph to their you know humor and stuff like that their oh, characteristics yeah. Well, I, you, you see that in movies as well. The sequel is like we take the concept, but we put them in, you know, Japan, and all of right. a sudden we have a new story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, let's let's. I'm going to turn on my uh, second screen here so we can see some of this book, uh, mm -hmm. and let's just talk about how great George McManus is. If you have any um, anything you want to say about him and his history, and uh, and the strip in general, then go right ahead. Uh, well, I can. <laughs> Oops, wrong place. Wrong place. <laughs> Oops, it's sideways. There we go. Yeah, hopefully my camera is uh, seasick. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. No problem. <laughs> We've got a good introduction from Bruce Canwell here, where mm -hmm. he talks about um, George McManus. And one of the things that I was uh, I found out through this this strip is he was actually kind of a you know a celebrity. Mm -hmm. you, you don't think of cartoonists as being big time celebrities. But uh, but George McManus kind of was. Yeah, was I mean, it, interesting enough about bringing a father was that it was on the front page of the puck section of Hearst Papers that, you know, when you have the, when you're the first page of any Sunday comic set, that's the ones drawing you in, the first joke you're going to read. And McManus for 1918 all the way till, till, he, till he passed away in 1954, his strip was on the front page of every puck section. Wow. So, and and it was it basically, he would have the front page, even though after the relevance of his strip. And also you would find when you do research is that a lot of the, when you, when you go look at papers in the 1920s and, and had only one comic strip, you would find Bringing a Father there. So Bringing a Father really was one of the, really the first, one of the first daily strips that became a big success all over the country. Uh, one of the major stories in this book is going to the coronation, a coronation of um, yeah. King Henry the, which mm -hmm. one was he? Henry the, or sorry, King George the sixth, uh -huh. who was uh, actually the coronation was actually happening at the time. So this mm -hmm. was a very contemporary story right. of current mm -hmm. events, um, and I love it. I just love the humor in this. He's got such a good play between the um between maggie and jigs these two characters mm -hmm. their relationship um it is so funny it, it, it's 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 funny because uh, you look at someone that they really love each other yep and but he does not want to he does he wants to be himself yes and he's trying to be forced like it's like it's like saying like suddenly you become a celebrity you know you still want to be yourself you know you don't, but also some people want to be like oh i gotta wear fancy clothes now and do all these things so, you know, I have to join the society, but you really want to be your own self. But that's hard. It's it's the it's the it's the the bat the, the the conflict the balance between both those the, the lives you had before and afterwards. Yes, I, and I guess we should mention for those of you who don't know anything about this strip, the premise mm -hmm. is that we have sort of a a middle class family who came into the money, mm -hmm. and so they are trying to. Um, reconcile their old life with their new life, and that's mm -hmm. the that's the tension and the the interplay right. between these characters. Um, and they're, they're, they have a daughter as well, who's kind of embraced the socialite life, and mm -hmm. um, and, and Jigs yeah. himself just wants to kind of, and, like and, you said, be himself. And yeah, and then you have a, you have the dumb son, and then the dumb son. Yeah, yeah so the dumb yeah. son comes later on yeah. in this book. Well, I mean, I mean, he would, have, he would be dumb anyway, but now he has money. You now he does things like, like being a, you know, like he, if he, had, he, he would be the same person who had three dollars in his pocket. He still do uh, be a, a loafer and stuff like that. But now he has yes. more money to be loafing around. <laughs> now, I'd imagine that this strip probably uh, was quite popular because this is dep the depression, right? The Great Depression. So a lot of people. Um, reading this, who are going through financially hard times themselves, are looking at mm -hmm. this and like maybe living vicariously through their lives, uh, the lives of of Maggie and. Jake. Well, I, I, it's possible also because remember, it, remember it was the twenties where it also was big too, and that people had money in the twenties too. So the, the people related that also about finally having money. Yes, you know, yeah. and then 
then I don't know. I don't remember. I don't remember the period the strip dealt with the uh, depression at all. I mean, I've, I've read that period yet, but uh, it, it, it's it's a fifty fifty. I think people like to remember the the good days and also dealing, you know dealing, dealing with what you do in life. You know. Yeah. Uh, there are some. So they they get to London. They take mm -hmm. a, a steam. So okay, where's yeah. the strip? I want steam liner. Steam liner. Steam liner. They. Yeah. Uh, there's one strip in here that I thought was just hilarious because um, Jiggs, I should have made a note of where it was. Jiggs, Jiggs basically says, um, why on earth do we want to take a steam, a, uh, a steam liner all the way across the ocean when we could just listen to it on the radio and watch it in the movies when it actually happens, after it actually right. happens. And it's like, that is such a funny attitude because we're still talking about that today, especially being in a pandemic right now. Yeah. We're doing everything online. It's right. like, uh, and now I'm at the point where it's like, why do I need to go to a theater to watch a movie when it's going to be streamed? Like I could just right. pay the money and watch right. it in the comfort of my own home now. <laughs> but right. he was well, saying the same that's, things. That's the issue now. I mean, we're, we're getting, we're getting out of it now and people have gone to theaters and, the question is, are we going to go back to that kind of concept exactly. in our lives? <laughs> but uh, it's, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you want to see it live or on tape? You know, it's like, you know, that's the question. Yep. I, I love his artwork too. He's just such yeah. a great cartoonist as well. Look mm -hmm. at the designs, the, the designs mm -hmm. on the dress there, the amount of paper he puts in this one panel <laughs> of yeah. all of these maps. Well, he also delves into fantasy. I mean, you have, you have strips in the book that he, the character leaves, jumps from one strip to another. Oh yeah, we'll get to that. That's um, there's there's the, the really remarkable strip. Here's one that I want to show. Uh, when they get to London in the coronation, this is the actual scene of them watching the coronation. It's a the the whole strip is one big long panel. <laughs> Instead of being, I can divided. relate to that. I've been to concerts. You know? Oh yes, yeah. And if you are not a tall person, it's kind of hard. But I love like the yeah. there's one guy climbing the pole, and yeah. the other guy stacked on top of each other. But mm -hmm. what I love about this strip. Is that nobody is wearing black except for Jigs? Mm -hmm. He's got Jigs in his black, you know, tuxedo or his mm -hmm. his black suit. So he stands out. He's clearly the focal point in mm -hmm. this strip here. That you like, yeah. you just look at it at a glance and you know where to look, where where to find the main character amidst this mm -hmm. crowd. It's just yeah. wonderful cartooning, great right. composition. It, it's the great thing about going through. He goes through all that to get to London to see you know, the car, and you can't even see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really, really great. So yeah. yeah, let's go over to, so this book here um, breaks it up into a couple of different sections. They have mm -hmm. all of the dailies together because the dailies were one continuity, mm -hmm. uh, three steps per page. And then halfway through the book, we, we get to the color section where we have the Sundays because mm -hmm. the Sundays were a continuity of their own. And uh, again, great cartooning. Look at those, mm -hmm. this conversation, the people talking over each other and the way he uses these words it was robert alton before robert alton it's just fantastic <laughs> uh but yeah let's find that strip that i'm talking about here um because he brilliantly i should have marked i didn't mark yeah. any of these pages but he brilliantly <laughs> uses uh the topper strip yeah um oh here well you, you want to explain toppers to some people who don't sure are? yeah let okay. me know what a explain what a topper is for me okay topper was that originally throughout the 20 the cartoons would have a full page and then they realized that okay, we can actually uh, you can actually m manipulate the page, and you could actually have don't have to have the full comic on the page, so the cartoons could have like two lines on top and create something else, and they could uh, do do two strips instead of one. And that was very popular throughout the twenties, thirties, and forties. I mean, uh, the most famous ones are uh, that in the reprint business, of course, is the uh, you had that the Flash Gordon Jungle Gym. Yes. Where Jungle Jim was the top top tier of the Flash Gordon page. That's right. Uh, and so this one in this case is called Rosie's Bow. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was the topper strip. You can see it's just two lines. Mm -hmm. And then there's another one. And then there's another one. And mm -hmm. uh, Dean has pre-printed three toppers uh, that feature this one character, Sir Von Platter. He's a forgetful guy. He doesn't know where he is. And he's like, he's looking for jigs. And this is very meta before that was a term, but they're like, you, um, you, you need to be in the strip below yeah. <laughs> basically. Oh yeah. Here it is. Well, Herman did that a lot with crazy cat. And yes. Like he had the, yeah. yeah, definitely. He, Herman did it all the time, but here he's yeah. saying 
how stupid of me. I'm in the wrong comic strip. I should be in the right. comic below. <laughs> he, just, he just can't find his way to the comic strip below. Right. And he shows mm -hmm. up a few more times trying to find how to, mm -hmm. trying to figure out how to get to the comic strip. Then we get to this one here, and this is just brilliant. <laughs> And you can see how it works. Here's the topper strip, and then bringing yeah. up father was below. And he realizes all he needs to do is hop down below to be in this uh, strip here. Right. And and Jigs is like, "What? What's going on?" <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Um, and then he joins this story. And I mean, the close yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the close thing we have today is some cartoons actually have had other characters appear in their strips. But so, this this one actually interacting between the two strips is just mm -hmm. brilliant. And what is also brilliant is yeah. that Von Platter goes over here and then he falls and creates a racket. And the sound <laughs> effects go up here so that yeah. the people in the topper strip can hear it. What's that? <laughs> or is it must be the peculiar, peculiar uh, creature again. Mm -hmm. So it's like these two strips, these mm -hmm. two lines are happening simultaneously. I love right. it. I think it's just absolutely brilliant. Mm -hmm. Uh, but this did pose a problem for Dean because his, um, if you go Focus back a page, yeah. one Sunday takes right. up an entire page. Right, yeah, How he, do you he's, print, he's not printing the, printing the topper. He's not printing the topper on that page. And so what he had to do was he he faded it out this page here. He faded it out. And so on the next page, he's got the full Sunday. You can see mm -hmm. Von Platter coming down through the top here. Mm -hmm. And then Von Platter actually also falls through the panel. <laughs> and George McManus has a borderless panel here yeah. to show mm -hmm. that he is in limbo. He's falling right. like into limbo here. Mm -hmm. And he, he has to pull him back up into here. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a brilliant page. And then at the very yeah. end, um, he goes to what well, I think he goes to use the restroom or something like that. Or no, he goes to find the library and he finds himself in limbo again there's a, the <laughs> final panel is borderless and he says this isn't the library how'd i get out here where am i <laughs> it's just i love it it's just so yeah. so creative and brilliant yeah. and unfortunately he doesn't do that every single time uh -huh. um but uh it's still still really really good right. stuff yeah mm -hmm. so we get through all of these color pages mm -hmm. and then we uh and then it does the, the the last third of the book is more black and white telling a few more stories it's the full two years mm -hmm. oh yeah he breaks it into acts to, to kind of divide up the storylines mm -hmm. um great stuff mm -hmm. um yeah i could just go on and on about this artwork <laughs> yeah. there's just so much to love the silhouettes mm -hmm. i love things like this where you can follow the it's, action it's, she throws it into the next panel and it yeah. immediately comes back mm -hmm. like the you can see it right, but then right. you have to show the the final action yeah. down here in the third mm -hmm. panel very, very much slapstick oriented humor. So slapstick, and yeah. there's sometimes where uh, there's one panel, and I, you know, I should have marked this, but Jigs is walking down the street, and um, mm. McManus put him walking behind a phone booth, or no, sorry, a telephone pole. So you can't actually even see, um, uh, you can't even see Jigs's face in the panel. Mm -hmm. Just interesting composition, but I love it. it. There's just so much to love. Really, really funny. Um, mm -hmm. Not just in slapstick, but just uh, right. like. You think about like a screwball comedy, the mm -hmm. kind of stuff you'd see in the 1930s. Like this is the kind of dialogue yeah, and yeah, kind of situations yeah. you get. Yourself and that's unfortunate. That's unfortunate. I mean, because the because that's why it 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 it's only set for screwball comedies work in a particular time frame. So that's that's why unfortunately the popularity of the strip goes down. Of you know, really the 40s and 50s because that's not the humor that people are interested in anymore in a sense. And this strip actually lasted until 2000 when it was yeah. finally canceled, believe right. it or not. Just incredible that it lasted that long and yeah. still trying to do the same thing with the same, yeah. same yeah. time. Well, period. you got to remember, McManus only went to 1954, so a lot of cartoonists worked on that afterwards. Yes, right. very true. Okay, I think that uh, that gives us a great look at, at this Um we haven't had any comments, so I hope that people are enjoying our our, uh, our conversation here. Oh, where did you go, Jeff? I lost you. Let me get you back here. I think, oh, I'm so loaded. That's what it is. <laughs> Technology, I'm trying to do two things at once here. Uh, oh, there, I'm back. There you are. There you are. <laughs> I, was, I was in limbo. I got the guy were... from the Great Enough Father strip with me. <laughs> I found him. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, uh, you know, I'm trying to host and talk and <laughs> use two cameras and try and do all the behind the scenes stuff all at once. I need to hire a, a, a technical person to do this <laughs> behind the scenes stuff for me. No, but it's great. Um, 
thank you for joining me for oh, for sharing anytime. your walk through your comic history and and your love for for these comic strips and mm -hmm. talking about bringing up father it is just a there's so much to love uh, about this strip and i hope that uh, it, somebody in the future if not the library of american comics but somebody else will be able to print some more of this because there is so much untapped uh material from george mcmanus himself that has never seen the light of day since its original publication if if they want to read more of the stuff, I believe that you can read it on the King Features website, comic, uh, their comic, King, comic Kingdom stuff. They're reprinting stuff from the mid to late 40s now online. So Amazing. you can actually read more of that stuff if, after, after, of course, buying all, all the books, of course, first. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And these are these ones are getting a little harder harder to find. There are still a few outlets that mm -hmm. that have these for sale. I know that in Canada you can even order them off of um, Indigo mm -hmm. chapters still. But uh, get them while you can because uh, there's the demand is not high enough. I think especially with the books are that big, the reprint <laughs> costs are so expensive that we probably won't see them reprinted. It'll be up to another publisher down the road to uh, figure out how to. Publisher still exists by then. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yep, yeah, that's great. Everybody bringing up Father, these two volumes. I don't have the other one handy to, to show you right now, but uh, we'll talk about that one another time on another live stream. So, uh, Jeff, uh, where can people find you if uh, they want to look you up? Uh, Do you have a I, presence online? Not really that much. And I'm sorry. I, I, have, I have a Facebook page under my name, but that, 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 I mean, I'm mostly that I'm not, I'm not into the, I'm the 21st century. I'm still an old guy from the 20th. <laughs> well, you do some but, writing for uh, the stripper's guide. Every yes, I do. Yes. Yes. I do stripper's guide. I, I do right now do a series for, called uh, history. We did it. We did one of those surveys again, which we are taking. We took the, we took 300 papers that was available on their, on the different, both newspapers.com and newspaper archives that had three in the papers and we're kind of like going through the history of the rise and falls of certain strips. After starting, we started 1978. We got to 1984. I've done research up to 1988. Uh, Being a father, unfortunately, is not that many papers in the 300, if you, the current stuff. Yeah. But uh, we've seen like some rise, for better, I've filed now the rise of for better, for worse right now. That's right. Going from, from a uh, few papers now up to about a hundred of the 300 right now. Uh, the, every year so far, we have not seen any knock down the Peanuts King yet. <laughs> although, Gar, although Garfield's coming up around the bend, which I don't know if Garfield will ever, in, in the research we've done, we'll see if Garfield takes over the number one spot. But unfortunately, what we're seeing, uh, when we go for the thing, we're, we're seeing now of the uh, beginning of the universal comic section, which I call that, where where you basically, God damn light. <laughs> there we go, that's a guy. Uh, the the um where most papers have the same com same comic strips in the same papers you don't like it's not like when you go back to the old days when you can go different cities you could find different strips but mostly today unfortunately when you start seeing starting in the mid 80s yeah. where it becomes very the same 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 strips are in the same papers unfortunately it's so all hagar and wizard of id and yeah the Andy uh, Cap. <laughs> peanuts blondie beetle bailey yeah you know, calvin hobbs at, at, during the 80s Bloom County, which you guys yeah. did a very good job reprinting that stuff. Right. I mean, and uh, I think after doing for Better Force, you probably got uh, you got. I think that covers the main, the '80s strips that that, that were introduced. That's right, between Bloom County and um, and for Better for Worse, and you could probably throw Doonesbury in there. <laughs> yeah, the of... Doonesbury is available by another publisher, and Calvin was done by yep. another by, by the publisher. So you got the basic, the king of the the '80s. Uh, strips that were, and of course Garfield, and Garfield which is, of course, yeah. yeah. I think the <laughs> yeah. only one that I don't think of the strips that became big in the eighties that I don't see that much is Kathy stuff. And right, that's true. Yeah, yeah. I mean, other than that, I mean, there are other there are other strips in the mix, but you know, by, by publishers, but uh, of the brand new stuff. And of course, you've done. A, I mean, I'm a fan of adventure strips. You've done a lot of the great revival of the adventure strip strips from the seventies and eighties. Which you know, Spider Man and the uh, Star Wars and Star Hawks and right, yeah, and uh, Star Trek, Star Trek, yeah, that was, that was all the stars, that, all the stars, yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know, I would love to see more of those, but those, of course, are hard. You know, I mean, you know, like I would love to see Howard the Duck, and I love to see the Hulk come out. Oh, but that's yeah. a, that's that's other issues with that one. Uh, oh man, yeah. I mean, unfortunately, we had to put a stop on the Spider Man ones because they weren't selling as much as IDW was hoping. Uh, so if there's no hope for Spider-Man, then Howard the Duck is right out. <laughs> <laughs>
Unless oh, Marvel boy. decides to reprint it, which they haven't. I mean, I mean, I'm, I mean, like I'm disappointed. Like I mean, sometimes only, only book I've seen like the major two publishers do was the Spirit. They did the dailies, and unfortunately, yep. it's one of the worst reprinted Spirit, worst book ever uh, in publishing wise. You ever, ever saw that one? Uh, no, it's part of the Spirit archives, I and they see. decided to put the strips in a comic book form, where the strips were oh, like this big. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said that. Oh. Okay. So small. <laughs> that was that was a disappointment. But I would like to see it, but I was disappointed seeing it in such a small right. form, you know, stuff like that. But yeah, it, you, know, you have access to a lot of the times. Yeah, yeah, luckily we have we have access to people have access to read the stuff of, uh, online if they want to spend the money and the time and looking for things. Right. So they, they it's one of the good things about today with everything going online and being up a, uh, scanned into uh, computers, you could actually read a lot of the strips that you. Uh, uh, thing I, I mean, I got to read. Uh, I mean, we put uh, uh, some of the George Evans secret agents on. Uh, found a paper that ran it, and, and that after your book, I got to read that stuff. Right. But, uh, but I would love to, see, you know, I would love to see other things too. But unfortunately, I know that's uh, it's not. Uh, it's uh, it has to do with how, how sales is everything, as they say, and people have enough people interested in it. But it's true. Okay, we've got a question actually from Michael. He asks. Have you seen any of the Bringing Up Father films starring Mickey Rooney's father, Joe Yule, from the late 40s and 50s? No, I haven't. And I once asked a question to – the films were done by Monogram. And Monogram – those Monogram film period was owned by Warner Brothers. And I asked, I asked once on the Warner Archives podcast that question, and they don't have the rights to those, those, those films. Hmm. So the question is, I believe, if my rights – Pepe King Features has the rights to those – those films to actually, and if they ever want to release it, I don't know. You know it's, it's 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 released some on DVD or they probably have the rights to that. By the way, that's why I haven't. That's why I probably haven't seen them. Though. I don't know packages in so that, not, not public domain, so you won't see them in the PD line. You know, stuff, but uh, those films I think are owned by King. I think they're owned by King Features, so they're the ones that will ever release them. It's up to them. Huh. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think people don't realize how big of a success Bringing Up Father was. Like, I mean, you have movies oh, made yeah. of you and movie serials and stuff. That's a big deal. The radio. Yeah, program. I mean, uh, King Features had a very good run with uh, with movie serials with their with their products. Universal. They had they had a lot of there a lot of they had a deal with them. Long had like almost every. I think for I think for two calendar years, all the serials that Universal produced were based on King Features characters. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They did a Red Barry. They did a secret. They did a secret agent. They did a couple Flash Gordons. You know, Tim Tim. They just didn't no, I think they, they but those they, they had a whole run of that stuff. They did yeah. uh, just wise. But and, uh, uh, Steve Canyon had had his movie serials as well, and like yeah, if you go online, I'm sure YouTube someone's uploaded. Those yeah, Steve Canyon's funny. available on DVD. You could probably get the entire series on this. It was released on DVD, and I think I think decades the cable channel did show a couple episodes of that in the nice. last couple you know, years. But uh, that that you know, it's it's. It's available. It's not that hard to find though, that particular right. character. Uh, Terry is another issue. I mean, Terry the Pirates. I think all the episodes are available online to watch because they're P they fell into PD, the, ah. the TV show from the fifties. Oh, we should show them on the Low Act TV sometime. Yeah, you actually good. could. You know, I, there there cool. are sixteen episodes. You can look. Yeah, you can show them as part of Low Act TV. I know the, uh, the radio the radio show we did for a little while on the uh, the podcast. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very cool. Okay, we should wrap it up. Thank you, Jeffrey, for uh, joining us today. Uh, everybody, Thank you, don't forget to uh, subscribe, like us, follow us on social media, all of that stuff. And um, yeah, enjoy the rest of your day. I hope it's sunny where you are. And uh, yeah, sunny. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> Same with us over here in Vancouver. Um, enjoy it, everybody. We'll see you later. All right.